All right. My name is uh, Stefan, and I work at uh, Project Place as a backend developer. But since my fingers are kind of sticky, I'm in all the R's now. So I'm actually a bit involved with the infrastructure as well. So I will talk a bit about how we moved from Windows to Docker. And uh, yeah, so I will talk a bit uh, how, how we did it and uh, what steps we took along the way and uh, yeah, all the tools we actually used to make it happen. First question, then, why Linux? Well, several reasons. We are a Python shop here, so we uh, actually do everything in Python. And uh, Python on Windows is, yeah, it works, unless you need some special modules that you actually need to compile. Then it's a huge mess because each of them use different versions of Visual Studio. And uh, it's just a few people here that actually know how to compile them, which is a huge bottleneck. So we ended up not upgrading some modules due to that. And yeah, that doesn't work. Another reason is fast CGI. It's an old application server, really old. I don't think it has been maintained in seven years or so. And so we were riddled with bugs that we actually had to patch ourselves. And that uh, we actually had some downtime due to it uh, during some circumstances. So yeah, we needed to move away from that. Yeah, and, some, and uh, our developers, most of them actually use uh, Apple today and uh, OS X. Uh, a few still run Windows and some run Linux. So it wasn't a perfect uh, environment to actually make sure everything worked as, as it should. And there are several other reasons why we want to move to Linux. I mean, maintenance of Windows is also a huge mess, so it's easier with Linux. So. We had to do some type of proof of concept. Should, would our service actually work in uh, in Linux to begin with? Uh, it's uh, been in Windows since '98, so I mean, it's a lot of legacy in there. Uh, so the first thing we had to start working on was actually a way to move away from the SQL driver and the SQL driver that we used in Windows, called ADODB. So we had to make sure we could uh, simultaneously run two different uh, uh, drivers. One that actually work in the Linux because ADO DVD does, does not. So actually, before this project started, that was evaluated and work began uh, testing the code with the uh, PyMS SQL. We are still running our database in uh, Microsoft's uh, SQL Server, so uh, so we haven't moved away from that yet. Someday we will, might. Uh, we also had to migrate from uh, Python 2.6 to 2.7, which could be problematic, but uh, yeah, we had to test it. And then it's the case insensitive problem. Oh my God, we have huge problems with that uh, in, in the beginning. It, nothing worked, we couldn't compile anything. Yeah, it was a uh, yeah, huge pile of crap, really. Um, we also did a lot of logging to local files for everything, uh, access to the uh, output of test uh, runs and yeah, pretty much everything. So we had to, go through all the code and actually start logging to a central server. So we choose Elk for this, of course. Uh, so everything is logged there now. Uh, so that was part of the proof of concept. We, we knew we had to do something. Uh, we sh picked uh, UVSGI as the new application server, which is a quite well-known application server for Python and other languages, actually. It, doesn't, it worked with Ruby and a lot of other types as well. So we picked that one. And uh, we actually had to go through all the legacy configuration in Apache with FastGI and port it over to a format for uh, UWSGI. And that was interesting. But a lot of issues there to begin with, but we, we managed to solve them all. Uh, one good thing was that we actually used uh, Apache on Windows. So the transition to Apache in uh, Linux was quite little, so that, that was a positive thing. And then there's the case of uh, configuration. Uh, we, we needed a way to maintain two types of uh, configuration, one for the Linux environment and one for Windows. So we came up with a template-based system for that that could replace things that path and how a path should look like in, the, in Windows, etc. And we picked Ubuntu. Maybe not the best Linux distribution, but they have a sane release cycle. A lot of other distros have, yeah, they 
half a year releases and uh, yeah, it doesn't work. You want one you can rely on for a bit longer than that. And I know some might say, why didn't you go with Red Hat? Well, we don't like to pay for free stuff <laughs> when we don't have to. <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, everything went quite well. We had some initial issues with uh, how Python actually shares state when it's running in an application server, which caused nasty seg faults at the time. So, uh, usually when under pressure, when things uh, started stepping on each other. And this, there was a hidden feature in the UBS guide to turn that off. And we had to search quite a bit and uh, running a lot of uh, GDB debugging on this to actually find out that there was an option to fix this. So yeah, that's what the uh, Eureka moment when we found it. Everything just started working, so you go, woohoo! So we have a go. <laughs> um, we also use uh, uh, the PyMS SQL driver, as I told you earlier. And uh, of course, there were issues there as well. That driver is, well, they haven't released the driver in three years, I think, but they are committing stuff every day on the master, but they haven't done a release in three years, which was kind of scary. <laughs> but we took that code and fixed things, and uh, now it's running, and it's working quite flawlessly, I'd say. Uh, yeah, and front end, yeah, we had issues there, mainly because uh, we had to do some major jumps in uh, MPM and Node.js uh, uh, things, which didn't work with the build system they had. It was kind of old, so we had to rebuild that from scratch yet again uh, using Gulp. So we did that transition as well. So there was a lot of uh, key things to actually fix before we could say, yeah, let's move ahead and uh, move to Linux completely. Our unit tests, it's, they are quite, we have quite many, I think we are around almost near 7,000 unit tests right now. So they actually helped us find the key issues between Windows and Linux. Uh, and then someone, some test was kind of stupid, doing, uh, rely, relying on, um, on local uh, settings uh, for, for the system. So uh, Windows, it expected some sort of order that Windows uh, provided. And well, that didn't work in Linux, of course, because it wanted to sort something differently. So we fixed those tests and removed it because it wasn't valuable. So yeah, well in the end it, it worked pretty well. We did this uh, proof of concept in about a month, uh, rewriting all this, and yeah, we think it's uh, we could continue actually going to production with this. So we got a go for the project. We went through and did it in three uh, three phases. We started with development and moved on to testing, and then of course production. So how do we get this out to the developers? We knew Docker was around the corner. It actually was released two months before we started the project. So in July, uh, zero, I think, was released of the Docker. So we thought, whoa, let's see if this can be a solution to our problem. Um, but this would still require a bit of work for each developer to actually set up Docker locally on their computer. and. Yeah, everyone isn't uh, that happy running Homebrew or whatever. So we wanted a way to actually fix that for the developers and make it easy. So we created a tool for that, of course. We named it PP Tool, Product Based Tool. It's uh, actually a local Docker orchestration engine, more or less. I will, if we have a few minutes over in the end, I will actually demo it. Uh, but you actually just curl it and pipe it to Bash, and it installs itself. And you run a few commands, and it, if you have a Macintosh, it will actually install Parallels. It will uh, wake and boot an uh, Ubuntu image, and it will uh, uh, put Docker on it, and it will uh, act, uh, download our uh, Docker images and start them in the order they are required to run and with all the parameters. So they run pptool up, and they have a complete uh, development environment running. Usually it takes less than 10 minutes. And in Linux, it's even simpler because you only have to install Docker more or less, and it's up and running. Uh, one one good thing with this approach is that we have, the images we build, uh, they are used in production as well as in development. So we know the the image they are using to do the day-to-day -day work actually works. So testing, yeah. 
We, during the phase where we actually had to move from Windows to Docker or Linux, we wanted to, we had to run the both uh, environments simultaneously. So we had to create in our pipelines a way to deploy to both Windows and Docker. So it was possible to actually do some uh, online testing through a browser and see that, yeah, things are behaving uh, as we expect in both environments. Uh, we had some orchestration needs, of course, as well. Um, so we started evaluating Kubernetes first, but we soon ran into issues with that one. It didn't handle, uh, handle uh, shutting down and moving images in a, in a, or containers in a, in a graceful way. It actually just killed them on the, oh, up with another, because you have three running, so I can kill two, that's okay. Uh, at least in the early version. I hope it's changed now because that was unusable for us. Uh, we also tested Helios and ran into the issue that you couldn't have the multiple images. Oh, another failure. So we decided to, we, let's roll our own. And that's what we did. So we created a, a library called Docking Bay, which is just a smart library that does some cool things with etcd, which is a key store for uh, information. And wraps that together with Dockerpy, which is a well-known Docker uh, API to actually run things on the Docker. Uh, so we expose the Docker API on all our servers currently through with the client certificates and all that, so it's safe at least. Uh, and uh, nice ETC idea is actually our own implementation of our Python ETC library. We used some out there, but most of them have some issues with the uh, clusters. And we decided not to patch them because they have some design flaws we didn't like, so we built our own there as well. <laughs> and we chose CoreOS then to actually run our Docker infrastructure on with a few customizations. We, I will get to the details, but we, we actually uh, put in PyPy, which is a lightweight Python binary, which uh, we put in the... Um, in it early image to we, we we actually boot uh, our servers from the network and actually run them in entirely in the RAM memory, no state on the di or hard drives in the servers, which is a uh, pretty cool. I will talk a little bit more about that later. We also insert the VM tools. I know uh, that if you uh, get the image from CoreOS for ver uh, VMware you get it included, but if you want the TFTP version of CoreOS, they don't include VM tools. We, we wanted to run it in, on virtual servers as well. So we put that in on the fly, automatically, by just verifying some uh, signatures from CoreOS for every release. So when they release a new one, we have that one. It's, it's downloaded and patched automatically. So production, just a very simplified view over our current production environment uh, and, the, and the flow of things. We have a few other tools here uh, that I didn't mention. We have uh, the Admiral, fitting name, I think. Uh, it's actually, that's our orchestration engine. It uh, does some clear things. So when you boot a CoreOS uh, machine, it fetch stuff from DHCP and TFTP. It also downloads a cloud uh, config which I think we abuse the cloud config pretty much. <laughs> we do everything with it. Um, what uh, we actually start Admiral inside uh, uh, one of the core servers as well. Uh, so it's running Docker, but it's not visible here. It's actually inside the Docker itself. Uh, but it's a uh, bootstrap through cloud config. Uh, so. What happens then, we use, uh, I'm not uh, sure how many of you have used CoreOS, but it has a little daemon called uh, Fleet, or Fleet D, which is responsible for re registering itself in the etc cluster with some information about itself, and it does keep alive to update the value. So if it stops updating that value, it becomes stale and removed from etcd. So we, we utilize that to actually know which services are active in our cloud, so to speak. But we also let our service uh, provide metadata about themselves. So we, we, in, in, uh, we have an IP management system where we can uh, assign different tags to a server. Uh, so it could be, yeah, this is an application server, this is a RabbitMQ server, or whatever. 
and we can have multiple tags. So the moment it starts up, it registers itself in InterCD with that information. Uh, and then it's the admiral's job to actually discover changes in InterCD. So it notices, oh, a new server with the metadata, metadata tag uh, application server. Okay, this application server should have these uh, containers running. So it immediately goes to the Docker server if, by getting the IP from the ETCD, connects to the Docker API endpoint, and they check, do you have these containers? No. Okay, so it tells uh, the Docker daemon to, well, download these uh, images with these tags and start them up. Then uh, Admiral also do a quick check, so we have some uh, API uh, endpoints to actually verify that the uh, container is healthy, it, so it can run SQL checks and uh, file storage checks, and so when that's okay, it will actually do another call to our load balancer and tell you, oh, on this port we have a container running with this uh, information, it should be a member of this pool. It inserts it and, uh, well, voila, the service is in production and the traffic is coming to it immediately. And another nifty thing about this, we had a faulty server with bad mem raw memory, which uh, started to rebooting. It's self-healing, so it's the moment the, uh, the server came up again, it was fixed and uh, added to the load balancer again. So it's, that's a pretty nifty way to handle things. Um, yeah, I think that's about it about that. So, continuous delivery. Yeah, that's the key for our, how we do our, our uh, release cycles. Uh, we have used GoCD previously for could it be two or three years back, something like that. Uh, so we continue to use that, but we integrated Docker with it, of course. Uh, it fits very well. We really want the one-click deployment because it's easy for everyone. All developers essentially can just click through and uh, enable if all tests have passed. So th that's a good thing. We have, yeah, we have loads of pipelines. I will show you a few images here. Um, so this is what the, our GoCD looks like currently. There, there are a few more, not on the picture, but so in the bottom line there, that's all the Docker magic. So we have a quite a dependency tree of uh, Docker images, and they have to be built in certain or order. Uh, but yeah, this pipeline handles all that and tests some of the things and makes sure it's actually working in a good state. We have this uh, test next here that's actually uh, our pipeline that does all testing all commits from the developers. Every commit is uh, built and uh, deployed automatically without without the interaction from the developer into our test environment, so they can test things uh, immediately. And then we have the hotfix one, which, uh, which is uh, actually every Wednesday. We, we do weekly releases uh, normally. Uh, so each week we merge uh, the master branch into the hotfix. And then we can do bug releases during the week until the next release. Uh, so this is what this hotfix track does. Uh, we, we usually have a, around three, four releases per day into production. So it's, yeah, it's working really well. We haven't had any failure downtown yet. I hope we don't get one. We, we do rigorous testing, unit tests, and we run the smoke tests, of course, uh, which is uh, selenium tests. So we actually test everything thoroughly. So if one of these steps failed, we, yeah, that image won't go further. Uh, yeah, here, here you can see actually all the Docker, some of the Docker image being built uh, and actually moved around to different uh, Docker registries which we house uh, here at Project Place. And we actually have one uh, in Bangalore, India. And that proved to be a challenge because we have developers there as well. We have uh, two or three teams down there that needs to work with the same platform. Uh, so one thing we did here because the internet connection there is crap. <laughs> it's really, really slow. Uh, uh, at, at least from the Stockholm uh, uh, office down there. So syncing images was a pain. It took uh, doing a full sync of our uh, Docker repository, which is about three, four gigabytes or something. It took like eight to 16 hours. <laughs> yep, so that, did, that didn't work. So we came up with a pretty clever solution. 
we connected our Docker registry here in Stockholm to uh, uh, the Amazon S3 bucket and uh, created a clone from there down to Singapore. So every time you push here to Europe, it's uh, Amazon syncs it down to Singapore and India can pull from there and we cut the time down to under an hour. So, so this is pretty amazing stuff. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, Docker to production, zero downtime, which is what this was all about. We tested, since we tested the, our uh, new Docker things locally on the computers for a couple of months, we had it in test continuously, we knew it actually worked. It, we didn't have many issues left. Uh, and when we did the switch, we actually just rebooted the Windows server and the TFTB booted into CoreOS, so the Windows server was intact during the test. So we could just reboot back into Windows and have it up and running again. So that was a good game, a good thing to do. Um, uh, yeah, so then it was just about to disable the old servers and enable the new ones, let Admiral add them and uh, go. So that was it. So it was, it was actually a total anticlimax. We, we hoped something would break. <laughs> didn't. <laughs> we hoped that the customer would notice, but no, they didn't. Well, some did, because they noticed a performance increase. On the same hardware, we actually gained quite a bit of increases. The API, some, one customer came back, what have you done? Our times to do synchronization against your API is four times faster. But, well, we are running Linux now. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so it was, yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, all of this happened quite quickly. We started sometime in September uh, and uh, did POC for one month and moved on to uh, creating PP tools to run uh, Docker on the local uh, workstation and uh, invited some extra users in the end of November, put one uh, internal server, uh, production server uh, in use and uh, told our load balancer to only take the office people uh, to that uh, node to make sure it actually worked. We didn't tell anyone, and no one noticed that either. So that was uh, how we tested. We tested on ourselves first. So, and that went well. So we put one out for the customers in uh, February, and they didn't notice either. And then we decided to do some tweaks, and then we just uh, exchanged every, all of the servers in April. So everything is running on Docker. And today, we are actually on the, yeah, on a revolution in our system. We have uh, re redesigned it again and they made even more improvements. So it's fa even faster today on new uh, hardware and uh, security is up a bit because when we started this, uh, it's what ETCD.0.5, uh, which didn't have uh, roles or user access or anything. So we, it was quite open, even if it was internal and blocked by firewalls. We, it was, wasn't that secure. So today we are running etc2 with, uh, with role access and stuff like that because the containers themselves ask uh, etc for its configuration when they start up. So that's how we solved it. Yeah, so uh, do you have a few minutes and I'll just show you people too. Yeah, and we can take some questions after that. This will be interesting. Yeah, oh yeah, if I can move the window. Yeah. And increase the size a bit. All right, I thought I should do it, so I will just, just pretend you didn't see this one. <laughs> I'm just going to simulate how it would be work on the, if you were on a Linux platform. Uh, so this is the line all the developers get when they start working here or <laughs> reset their computer, whatever they do. So that happens. And I will just uh, see if I have that in there. All right, the tool is in place. As you can see, you can start images, you can down and you can restart them, check status, you can get the shell uh, immediately into a, a Docker container and uh, some other stuff. Uh, and of course, everything comes with a tab completion. 
So th these are the containers we have today. Uh, and if I just run up, uh, they might be up, so let's down them first. Okay, they won't. Great. Let's see. Hard to type on the side. So yeah, I had a few running. And now something really failed because yeah, sorry. I, normally the first thing you do is do you run install to actually set up your computer, and I forgot to do that, so that was stupid on me. So here we can choose from which office, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> So this is actually a local mapping in, uh, to, to run my code locally on my computer inside the running container. So I get real-time changes when I update code. So I input that here, and it will be mounted. And I have an instance because we have a few external databases. And I let's see here. Yeah. Right. Hopefully. Yeah, so it's up and running, and uh, you didn't see the other one because they actually was up already, but uh, it starts uh, them in order. So I could actually reach my local development environment now. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions? <laughs>